Hey, it's Mazzy. Welcome back. I, I feel really fortunate of of being exposed to experimental music and uh, avant-garde somewhat. Uh, literally when I was 13, 14 years old from John Lennon and Yoko Ono and learning and being introduced into the fluxus movement of art, uh, creativity, everything from John Cage to Yoko Ono's experiments. Uh, and minimalist uh, composers uh, in San Francisco as well, all through the 70s and the 1980s. And um, the Beatles always set that stage for me to open up, whether it's Indian music, uh, which you'll, uh, I'll showcase here a little bit, drone, uh, just opening my eyes and ears to things and not turning myself off just because something's different. And I want to showcase uh, some some new wonderful albums, some on the ambient side, some more experimental fusion into the uh, jazz prog like fusion, some Indian uh, British drone music as well, some experimental uh, music from uh, the 1970s. Uh, and beyond. So I want to start out with uh, a new album by Michael Muller on Deutsche Grammophon. Uh, this is Michael's first album on Deutsche Grammophon. He has done records on his own independently. He is half of the uh, musical um, avant-garde neoclassical outfit called Balmeray with Rob Lowe, and they have two albums out on Deutsche Grammophon. This one was literally released last week on vinyl. It's uh, available digital. I'll put links to some of these things below because sometimes it's hard to find these records. And obviously in the case of some of these, there, there have been limited editions in terms of the vinyl pressing. Obviously you can stream it and I'm sure buy CDs of some of these. Uh, but this is a really uh, beautiful record. It's an ethereal record. It's an organic record. But when I say organic, it's, it's 10 pieces all have the theme or the title of Mirror One, Mirror Two, Mirror Three, and the title of the album is called Mirror Music. And Michael used various instrumentations, including the Mellotron, the Oberum, the two-voice synthesizer, and Rhodes organ to lay the foundations. And really the, should I say backing tracks, but the foundation for these 10 pieces of music and sent them out to uh, 10 different musicians that worked with him, collaborated with him to do overlays and supplemental instrument, uh, instrumental uh, bits on them. I think there's two songs that have the voice, one lyrically and one almost as, a, um, as an ethereal uh, feel to it. Uh, I think this is a beautiful album. I really like, uh, it opens up with just a really soothing, almost guitar-based song. Um, I like that a lot of these uh, sort of, you know, the term I remember back in the 1970s, which became a negative to some is the whole new age scene. And, you know, there, new age could be for good or for evil from my point of view, but there can be some, there were some wonderful composers that were lumped into that category. We didn't really, I don't remember even talking about neoclassical. We, we talk about 20th century composers and groups uh, in the 1980s, like the Kronos Quartet and um, Philip Glass and uh, artists in, in that realm. But New Age almost uh, was a, had a, a stigmatism of just everything surreal and calm and boring. And that's certainly not the case with music like from Val Moray or Michael Muller here. Um, I like when it gets into the second track, there's this beautiful pedal steel guitar and it soars. I'm, I'm a big fan of the work of Daniel Lenoir. Obviously, you may know him more as a producer, but his the way he plays on a pedal steel, it reminded me a little bit of this. And it just, it's, it was a beautiful uh, uh, soaring uh, soundscape, which I think is really wonderful. A lot of variety on this record too. Yeah, as I said, there are vocals almost like chants, uh, a little drone-like, but not as in that repetitive uh, style like minimalist can be. Uh, some of the other things I'm gonna show here will have that, but uh, not this record. Uh, side two, there's the opening track, and, and we always like to have an association, at least I do. I associate records with different types of music. And uh, the first track on side two, I guess it's mirror number six, reminded me of these sort of backing tracks of, 
of the layers of Peter Gabriel would do. Uh, especially, I kept thinking about um, the song Mercy Street uh, from uh, you know one of his biggest albums ever, and I just like the ambient sound, the repetition of that with a just a really gorgeous, uh, soulful uh, feel to this. This is a stunning album. There's a beautiful bass clarinet on one thing that really gives adds a bottom a texture to one of the pieces. But no two pieces are alike, yet all 10 pieces really fit well together over the course of uh, uh, the LP on this. But I love this record. Uh, this is Mirror Music on Deutsche Grammophon. I'll put links uh, to uh, some of these records below because some of them seem to be hard to find and not necessarily in your local store or even on Amazon, I'm not sure. But Deutsche Grammophon should have a more distribution than some of these records. Uh, so uh, I just love what Michael has done here. Uh, kudos to you, Michael. Beautiful record called Mirror Music on Deutsche Grammophon. Just came out. Next is an album that was a total surprise to me that um, I love when an artist takes a chance. They're going in one direction, all of a sudden they zigzag into something else. And um, that's why I've always been a fan of, of the early experimentation of John and Yoko's uh, back starting in 1968. And it got me into the, uh, the avant-garde uh, a lot more than probably that was the primary uh, influence for me on experimenting somewhat. Uh, back in um, 1968, actually. Uh, but this album just came out recently. Uh, this is called Asterisms, and this is the new album by Sean Ono Lennon. And this is a total departure. And it takes, I, I, I guess you could say, it takes some guts to do something like this and do something very different. Uh, I don't know how he sees his audience because he's really kind of zigzag with various productions. Uh, going back to um, In the Sun, Into the Sun, his first solo album, which is really more of a singer-songwriter solo record. Then teaming up with his uh, partner Charlotte in The Ghost of the Sabertooth Tiger, doing sort of some psychedelic, post-punk, uh, really wonderful music there. And the two of them playing, her great bass playing, and obviously his guitar and vocals as well. And of course... Uh, the uh, Lennon Claypool Delirium with Les Claypool, like great bottom bass, where the two of them with their band uh, fused Prague and psychedelia, and and I've saw I've seen all these uh, both those uh, projects of Sean's uh, over the years live in San Francisco Great American Music Hall, even when Bob Weir from the Grateful Dead uh, showed up at that show, and I saw here in Seattle the uh, Delirium several times as well when they've come through here. And of course, Sean has gone on to produce albums by the Black Angels, last year's Temples album, as well as other projects. And I love how he, he dips his toes and everything. And in the, in the notes on here, this is really a good setup for what you may or may not expect from the music on here. He talks about in, in 2020 when he got invited uh, for, by John Zorn, uh, the avant-garde guitar player, uh, who I've seen many times when he's done a, a series of shows in San Francisco where you play five nights and do a whole different direction uh, uh, on each night and how Sean got involved with the avant-garde in the Lower East Side, the East Village scene uh, early on and really was brought up with these interesting composers. Obviously, those of you who uh, know the first uh, Yoko Ono album, uh, Ornette Coleman plays on that, who was a very out there a jazz musician, avant-garde jazz musician, and uh, played with Yoko live as well. So he was brought up with the experimentation, obviously, being the son of, uh, of John and Yoko. But he was invited to do a series, of, like a weekly uh, night at the Stone, which was uh, which is John Zorn's uh, club in the uh, village in New York. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And he's been wanting to work on this project for some time. And he was uh, hopefully going to work with John Zorn. And then after that, uh, possibly uh, Julian Lodge, the great jazz guitar player who is on Blue Note Records, has a new album right now on Blue Note Records. Uh, Niels Klein, obviously, uh, the jazzy experimental guitar player as well, a member of Wilco. And all these kind of uh, projects, the nucleus of what was going to be this album fell through. And I think it was uh, 
Nils Klein, he talks about here, takes him aside and says, you know, you should play lead guitar yourself on this record. And I, I think he felt that he wasn't the player. It's hard to compete when you're talking about Nels Klein and uh, John Zorn and Julian Lodge. Uh, those are amazing guitar players. And all the power to, uh, to Sean to take that on and doing this. Now, this is a really cool record and it's, it's an unusual record uh, for Sean, obviously. It's not a pop record, it's not a vocal record, it's an instrumental record. It fuses jazz, and prog and rock, but it 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 it's more on the um, the prog jazz side. It's not an overt jazz record. There are horns on this. He talks about being influenced by Miles Davis, starting with Bitches Brew. Uh, that on for me, silent in a silent way. The one just prior to Bitches Brew is that sweet spot. Is that perfect spot? But I totally understand that. And I've said this on my channel before. How when I first got Bitches Brew in 1970, I didn't get it. It took about three years for me to really understand it and to fall in love with uh, that record. And I love when an artist gets influenced by something. Now, there's a, there is a lot of variety here. Sometimes it reminds me of parts of King Crimson, not lyrically, but musically, and the arrangements, the percussive arrangements. Uh, the opening track on side two, there's only, what, six, five tracks on the album. The title track, Asterisms, the... the you know, we're always like reaching for something to compare a record to, to compare music to. And the 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 piece of music, and the, or the album at least, that um, I associated with asterisms, and I don't know if, if uh, Sean has uh, listened to this or, or, or was influenced by it, but that reminds me of the uh, Chick Corea uh, album, a Spanish Heart. I think it's 1974, 1975. After the initial Return to Forever, uh, that really frenetic style. I mean, I'm a fan of the beginning Return to Forever with Flora Parim and Ayrto, where it's got a more Brazilian feel, and then they get into Stanley Clark, and it's got the frenetic stuff. Spanish Heart is kind of straddles both those things, and that's a, a record that I like. And for some reason, Asterisms, uh, that track, that 11 minute almost track, remind me of the spirit of that. Not, you know, copying it, not taking exact things, but there's a little bit of a Spanish uh, or feel to it. Uh, you know, not in a way like um, Miles Davis' Sketches of Spain, which is the Gil Evans more orchestrated work. I just think this is a, a really good album. A lot of variety on it, a lot of interesting. Um, experimentation on it and but it's not a a total challenging record i think it's for the sake of something being a little out there uh it's very accessible now uh for pop artists and beatle fans uh, that might be a different thing but i think this uh is a success uh so um sean london beautiful record uh asterisms and this is on sadic records I had to order a copy at a Norman Records out of the UK. I'm not sure what the distribution is like uh, here in the US, so um, we shall see. Next is a trilogy of records that came out last year. I just picked up two of these this week. I didn't realize the second and third album in this, quote, trilogy, uh, trio of albums from Real World Records actually came out last year. And I just happened to discover them uh, at one of my local stores. And this is Sheila Chandra on Real World Records. Of course, Real World is Peter Gabriel's label. And I was all in on this label uh, during the 1990s, especially on the compact disc when these records came out. And this record really changed things. Now, I didn't know the whole history of Sh Sheila Chandra. She's a London-based artist, Indian descent, Indian uh, musical taste, an amazing vocal range of, uh, I don't even know how you would call it, but the, what she what she does with her, her voice and her tongue and her mouth and the sound she gets is haunting. It's beautiful, sometimes acapella, sometimes with drone sounds. Uh, apparently she was on a British TV show when she was younger and has albums prior to these that I recently got a couple of them also. But this is the first of the three. I picked this up last year when I saw it. Uh, the next two I got literally this past week. This is Weaving My Ancestors' Voices. And this is a spiritual, beautiful, 
using her voice as an instrument. There are other uh, things mixed up, but it's primarily a vocal record uh, and a stunningly beautiful record, beautifully recorded, beautifully uh, produced. How she mixes this, uh, this sound is just nothing short of extraordinary on here. So this is the first one. This is the Zen Kiss. The second one, I believe this came out around 1994. Um, and uh, again, on a real world record, Peter Gabriel's label. Uh, this also mixes uh, Indian music with Western folk music. Uh, there is a track on here sung in English. That is a song that I believe Sandy Denny uh, recorded, and so it's really a Celtic ballad, a beautiful historic Celtic ballad, and it just sells, sends chills down your spine. Love this record. So maybe I would get this one first because of that that Celtic thing. And um, again, she mixes the Celtic and the Indian, uh, and it's just it's just a, a, an intense, uh, beautiful oral experience. A bone crone drone, the third of this uh, triptych of records on real world music. Uh, again, everything is that drone. In fact, there are six drones on here, literally called a bone, crone, drone, one, two, three, four, five, and six. A drone is a repetitive Indian uh, musical sound that is kind of the basic, the layers of what other instruments are added to. Sometimes it can be the complete piece of music. Sometimes it could be a section of music. And this is a very meditative record. Again, another gorgeous record. Maybe this would be the most uh, starting point commercially. But again, they're not commercial, but they're very, they're very enjoyable uh, from my point of view. Sheila Chandra, uh, unfortunately now, I think about a dozen years ago, she has a, 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 a an affliction uh, with her mouth that she's not able to sing now, which is such a tragedy because this is one of those beautiful voices. Uh, this is a bone crone drone. Lovely uh, series of three records on real world. Uh, these were all issued in 2023. Now I want to show two box sets, staying with the whole minimalism experimental music. Uh, this is a set that is available now that came out in the last several months. And this is the complete obscure recordings, record collection 1975 to 1978. Uh, this was the experimental avant-garde minimalist. You see the, you know, the, the theme here, a uh, record label uh, Brian Eno put together. Uh, obscure Records was a separate imprint offshoot of Island Records and, uh, it originally was going to start in the early 70s, but due to the oil crisis then and uh, limitations of vinyl pressing, it was delayed, I think, three years, which I think they thought was a good time. Uh, Island Records, you know, really took a chance with this label and it really didn't make any money. But I think uh, the first one in 1975, uh, I think there was a reaction because in 1974, the album Tubular Bells on Virgin Records was huge. Now, that is very accessible to some cases, but it is an experimental piece. Now that you've heard that for years, forever, for 50 years with that um, that theme that became the theme to The Exorcist, uh, that really set a stage for certain labels opening up and trying different things. And uh, Obscure Records didn't last long. This is the entire catalog. They only put out 10 records, again, curated by, mostly by Brian Eno. Some of these did better than others. I originally only had four of these records ever. Uh, there's Gavin Breyers, I believe, was the first one, The Seeking of the Titanic, that had a repetitive, repetitive voice of uh, The Sinking of the Titanic and Jesus' Blood Never Failed Me. This ongoing thing that apparently uh, drove uh, the the powers that be at Island Records. Uh, Chris Blackwell, to be specifically, didn't really understand what this is about, but he saw the writing on the wall with, again, with Tubular Bells and thought uh, 
they could experiment. The beauty of this too, uh, there is a, a lovely book in here with various essays and artwork of all the artists. It gets into the entire history and the original liner notes of every artist. It goes through the recording sessions. It goes with the artwork. There are two beautiful essays uh, by uh, our friend Tom Rashawn, who was a member of the Los Angeles Free Music Society. Also, I would meet him because of uh, him being an art director designer at Warner Brothers and then Capitol Records. But a really key part of these records is the art of obscure records. Uh, the records were designed by John Bonus of CCS Design Studio in London, and they were put together in a way of a CMYK plus one, five color, where you do a screen of black over the four color uh, printing here. And they would kind of do it in a way to save money and to keep sort of a, maintain a design style. And so all the original albums came out looking like this. These came out individually at the time. There would be one blotch of color left open here. And if you can see, you can see behind the black. Initially, it looks just like a black cover, but the screen of ink black over the color uh, really added something really interesting. This is a minimalistic uh, avant-garde piece. You have Christopher Hobbs, John Adams, Gavin Bryars here. I believe Gavin Bryars was also one of the uh, creative directors working uh, with this label with uh, Brian Eno. Uh, originally four records came out in the first batch at once. I believe, what, two years later, another four and then two. I'm not exactly sure on the, the whole um, Originals. Now, some of these artists went on to do greater things. Uh, John Adams, obviously, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, went on to do some amazing things on non-such records and sort of, uh, again, minimalist classical pieces, classical operas like Klinghoffer and Nixon in China. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful music. Again, some of the, again, has that neoclassical sound, some of it very experimental, and obviously something, uh, some very... Um, very uh, minimal. Brian Eno's uh, was one of the first original here with the first. And then David Toop and Matt Eastley, new and discovered musical instruments. Again, an experimentation here. And then you got Jan Steele and John Cage. Of course, John Cage is probably the name that uh, most people who dip their toe in the avant-garde and experimental classical music know of John Cage. Um, voices and instruments, part of the Fluxus movement again in the early 60s with uh, Yoko Ono. So that's where the, all this comes. This is where I was introduced to a lot of this music. Again, from John Lennon and Yoko Ono, their collaborations, and then diving in. Some of it I've liked, some of it I, I didn't get. You got Decay music, Michael Nyman, uh, probably one of the more commercial of these that went on to illustrious career uh, totally separately. And of course, this is the one cover art that doesn't have the color open here. Uh, this is the Penguin Cafe Orchestra, where they changed the name to the Penguin Cafe Orchestra, music from the Penguin Cafe. Um, I got into them and their stuff is very accessible, mixing a little bit of a pop sensibilities with classical, with um, folk music, uh, just really instrument, wonderful instrumentation. Simon Jeffries is the main sort of protagonist uh, uh, of the Penguin Cafe. You got, again, another uh, Gavin Breyer's combination machine music with John White. Opera by Tom Phillips, Irma. This is conducted by Gavin Breyer's. And of course, Harold Budd, who went on to, again, a, again, a lustrous career in the avant-garde and the new music. Um, this is Extended Cycles, works that began in 1972. So uh, what a wonderful collection. Over the years, some of these records have been reissued with regular cover covers. Uh, but uh, the history, the essays within this book uh, are just tremendous. And it's, it's a great collection, a great... Uh, introduction to minimalist music, avant-garde music, experimental music. That is the complete obscure records collection, 1975 to 1978. Just three, three short years. 
and probably headaches for Island Records. Lastly, I wanna showcase a box uh, that was sent to me by Tom Rashawn, who I mentioned, who worked on the liner notes or a couple essays on that uh, obscure set. I've known Tom virtually for a number of years. Again, uh, we kept missing each other or I kept missing him when I used to go down showing portfolios at the um, at both Warner Brothers and uh, Capitol Records in Los Angeles. But I knew his name. I've seen his name on design designs from uh, artwork and arts as as wide variety as um, Los Lobos to REM to uh, John and Yoko uh, at Capitol Records and reissues and box sets and literally many others, uh, both at Warner Brothers and Capitol. And I didn't know at the time during those years when I followed him as a designer that he really was an avant-garde musician, artist. Uh, and that is a member of the Los Angeles Free Music Society. I had vaguely heard of them. I didn't know anything about them. What I always associate with, once I got to know their name and hear more about them, is the equivalent up in the Bay Area where I lived in San Francisco were the residents. Now, the residents were a different entity completely, but they were both in a way collectives of mixing visual arts and music and experimentation. And um, I would think maybe residents had a different kind of sense of humor, sensibilities, but I've gotten more into um, hearing and reading and learning about uh, LA Free Music Society because of uh, my friendship now with Tom Rashawn. This box was a celebration of a show in 2016 at The Box. The Box is a uh, gallery space in Los Angeles, experimental uh, music and art, visual arts. And this celebrates a performance, ongoing series, in 2012 of the Los Angeles Free Music Society. Now they started in the 1970s uh, with their experimentation uh, out of uh, the record store. I believe that uh, Tom and several of the members worked on is at Pupas uh, in Southern California. Uh, we all worked in record stores and I just didn't do the experimental stuff like Tom did and, and his collaborators and, uh, but they did all these things, building their own instruments, doing their uh, own performances, doing electronic, uh, acoustic, electric, all kinds of instrumentations, you know. Obviously, so many of these uh, artists uh, that I talked about with Obscure Records and John Cage and others come to mind as a, a predecessor. Uh, Harry Parch building his own instruments is a predecessor to this. Uh, Tom, Rashawn designed this box set, and I cherish this box set. In, in a way, it's one of those fully realized art pieces of aural sounds, of music, of noise, of industrial, of, uh, again, it's this is the kind of music and all these records I think I showed today, um, maybe some more than others, are experimental or not for everyone. So dip your toe and listen to some of it and then go from there. Uh, I just love the artistic side alone. I mean, this is a day glow color box. I have a black light and I've tested it out at night. And yes, <laughs> here you go. Now again, this is a multi-record set that includes all the performances in chronological order from that original show that happened in 2012. Every night of the show, every day of the show, uh, they recorded. And it was a bunch of different uh, groups of the musicians that played uh, during that affair. This is uh, an opening reception improvisation uh, that opens this up. You can see here the poster of the original show. Uh, this is what the studio, parts of the studio look like at the time. And this is a wonderful, uh, box set and just a, a, a testament to the, the creative uh, art, artistry of this. Uh, there's Tom Rashawn right there uh, in the foreground right there. Experimental music, experimental 
uh, great photography. This is very much like a museum catalog for the show, if you will. Again, uh, this was done at a celebration in 2016. This was produced. I think there are some copies of this box set left. I will put a link below to the box in Los Angeles so you can see it. But uh, the curation, the design, uh, obviously Tom and his... Uh, there's a lot in here. There's posters, there's artwork, and talk about ephemera. And, um, you know, does it matter if it's upside down, Tom? I don't think so. I don't think at this point if it matters when it's upside down. Here is, okay, I have to show you this. This is basically the, po oh, look at this. This is the poster for the original show, I believe. Here and here. It's hard to maneuver. I should do cutaways. But let's just go through and let me just show you the artwork. Each record individually has its own artwork of details of some of the instruments, everything from uh, built instruments to toys to, you know, you got toys, electronic instruments, guitars, synthesizers, electronic, tape loops, tape recorders. I would have loved to have seen some of these. So again, noise, avant-garde, industrial, experimental, visual. Look at that, how beautiful is that? Springy things, wigs. I'm sure there were cables everywhere and plugs everywhere. You know, the thing about this kind of music for me is when you talk about the avant-garde and experimental, when I talk about uh, early John and Yoko, uh, the experiment when I heard, whether it's Two Virgins or um, Live with the Lions or The Wedding Album, obviously the uh, Live with the Lions, uh, there's a tragedy happened there when Yoko had her miscarriage at that time. Uh, but with avant-garde and experimental stuff, I, also I see the sense of humor in it. And I like, I think the intention and uh, the ideas of art like this sometimes is as important as the outcome. Uh, I've been to so many experimental uh, avant-garde uh, visual shows, conceptual art. Obviously I talked about the Fluxus movement earlier and it pisses some people off. And I think that in a way is the humor of this where uh, sometimes the idea is as or more important as the actual um, creation of the final piece or not. Now, uh, that's probably a simplistic, uh, you know, from my point of view, but I think there's something to that. It's about the idea and the visualization. And I, I feel fortunate to have grown up in a place where I saw and experienced a lot of it. Not, not that I liked everything. And some people, you know, will just say, that's shite, that's crappy. How can you like that stuff? It's not even music. Well, it, it's a sound, it's sounds. It's, it's experimental sounds of cut tape pieces and, and visualization. So uh, I wanna thank Tom for turning me on to this. And he actually uh, pointed me in the direction when that obscure uh, box came out. He mentioned he had worked on uh, some of the um, uh, essays in it. I had seen that it was coming and I, you know, he pushed me over in the fence to purchase that box. But um, I hope you like what we showed. We showed Michael Muller, a great uh, ambient, beautiful record. Uh, Sean Ono Lennon's new uh, experimental piece. I love that. Sheila Chandra, the Indian British uh, fusion there gorgeous records, and of course, Obscure and Los Angeles Free Music Society. So uh, thanks for indulging me and uh, check out some of this. Look at the links below. There are links to all these projects. Uh, thank you, Mazzy loves you.